First and foremost, I want to thank my patrons Tony Stunts, Generic JT, Geezer Windbag, Jake Brabick, Carlos DeLuca, Fatlander, and Ped Dispenser for your continuous support. It means the world to me. Now back to the Bay Area for this episode. We're talking about the second light rail system that this channel has ever done, and yes, I'm calling it a light rail. It's not a metro. I know it has below grade subway stations and it uses three different tunnels, but the average system speed is less than 10 miles per hour and the cars themselves run at grade and mixed traffic in many segments, so it's not a metro in my eyes. This is the fourth out of six SF Bay Area transit systems that I've done on this channel, as I've already covered VTA, Caltrain, Smart, and now we're on to Muni. All I'm really missing are Bard and Ace, which will for sure be featured in future videos, so stay tuned. Now you're probably confused, why does San Francisco have three different rail systems in the same city? Isn't BART supposed to be their city's rapid transit system, and isn't Caltrain supposed to be the commuter rail system? Well, yes, both of those systems do serve an important role in San Francisco, but their main focuses are to bring commuters from the surrounding suburbs, such as in the peninsula, and specifically the East Bay and Alameda and Contra Costa counties, into the job-centric city. Muni Metro's role is much simpler. Get San Franciscans across the city of San Francisco. Muni Metro currently serves five rail lines across six spurs, Although currently the L line is temporarily suspended and operates as a bus line for the time being, as repairs are taking place. These 72 miles of standard gauge track roll up and down San Francisco across 113 stations and stops. Like with all of my videos, I'll be riding on every single one of them, and because my channel focuses on transit-oriented development, I'll assess every single stop for how the community around it embraces their existence. So before the SF Municipal Railway became an actual governmental agency, private rail companies, which at this time ran cable cars, used to rent rights of way of streets that the city owned and just kind of operated their own schedule. Seeing as these private rail companies were inefficiently ran and rampant with corruption, voters in 1902 called for a city charter that aimed to absorb all of these private rail lines into one consolidated public entity that gave the city the power to simply buy out these private rail companies and thus Muni was created in 1906. But you know what else happened this year, right? The massive earthquake basically destroyed the majority of SF's buildings and left behind massive piles of rubble. Cable car lines suffered the same fate, and a lot of the infrastructure behind them was just destroyed, making an easier case for overhead electrification and streetcars over the archaic old cable cars. And with a lot of infrastructure already destroyed, it was a no-brainer to completely replace the railways. It took some time, but in 1912, the first ever municipal railway in the history of the U.S. was under operation, and by the 1920s, Muni was operating 11 streetcar lines, including the present J Church, K, and L lines, in addition to a surface-level streetcar line on Market Street. In 1918, the two and a quarter mile Twin Peaks Tunnel opened up for service to a mostly desolate and empty area, and this is one of the city's first streetcar suburbs. By the 1920s and 30s, the streetcar scene here was remarkable, with the ferry building taking the spot as the second busiest transit terminal in the world during this time. And it makes sense. All streetcar lines basically ended up on Market Street, and at the end of the street was the ferry system, which brought you to the rest of the Bay Area. In 1928, the Sunset Tunnel was built under Buena Vista Park for other rail lines. And you know what happens during the 1930s, right? The Depression was great, and Muni was forced to make drastic funding cuts as a result of declining tax revenue and ridership, meaning some fleets ran single cars for a minute and stops were cut entirely. It's the 1940s now, and with World War II now at the forefront of America's problems, there was a fear of imminent Japanese invasion, and so the west side of the city had a blackout, no electricity, for quite some time. There's another key player that I've left out of the story until now. The Market Street Railway Company was a private firm that had their own lines on Market Street, and a little to the south of the city, directly competing with Muni. Muni ended up buying them outright in 1944, but as nice as this seems, this was the beginning of the end. The trackage was approaching 40 years of age at this point, and deferred maintenance due to the war caused fleet to really age. So in the 1950s, Muni basically had to compete with brand new highways and private vehicles. In 1947, a new budget proposal leaned heavily towards funding more buses. In 12 years, two dozen streetcar lines basically disappeared in this span. Most of them did convert themselves to bus lines, signaling the beginning of the motor and trolley coach's domination. Now, let's put the metro in Muni Metro. 
Remember how earlier I said that BART was focused on getting people who lived in the suburbs into San Francisco? Post-World War II, many people moved out into the burbs and there was a huge demand for transit to these areas because traffic in SF was absolutely wild. In 1962, voters actually approved the construction of BART. And more on this in the eventual BART video, but more importantly, this bond would promise a double-decker subway underneath Market Street. One for Muni cars and one for BART cars. Muni would then keep going westward into its own dedicated subway tunnel onto the West Portal Station. Muni Metro Subway finally opened up in 1980, seven years after BART Subway opened up. This meant that all surface light rail routes would be discontinued on Market Street, citing the Market Street Subway as a replacement. In 1980, the M Ocean View line was connected to its current Balboa Park terminus to provide another BART connection. In 95, Muni opened up an extension of the J Church line through the Bernal Cut along San Jose Avenue. In 1998, the Muni Metro extended itself again, this time extending the subway from the Embarcadero station, turning right, and tracks were actually built in the median of the Embarcadero, south of Market, down to the Caltrain station, right by Oracle Park. Starting in the mid-late 90s, the T-Line was proposed. This would be built in two parts. The first part would be a purely surface line along 3rd Street, going all the way to Bayshore, sort of close to its Caltrain station, and the Sunnydale neighborhood. The surface line from 4th and King to Bayshore opened up in 2007, but the second part of the T-Line would be a mostly underground segment into Chinatown with underground stations near Moscone Convention Center, Powell Street, and Chinatown. This was actually approved in 2008, and it took about 15 years from conception to construction. In the year of our Todd God 2023, the T-Line extension into Chinatown was open, and I gotta say, I'm really happy. Muni Metro currently runs two light rail vehicles. The first is the older Breda LRV, built starting in 1996. These have a capacity of 150 people, go to a top speed of 50 miles an hour, but are hella heavy at 79,000 pounds. You see, a lot of residents had issues with these, with these very heavy trains on surface streets, making so much noise that their houses rattled as a result. Fueled by these concerns and the fact that they didn't age well, Muni starting in 2013 ordered new Siemens S200 light rail vehicles. They're the same speed, but the Siemens can hold 249 people with way more standing room and it's about a thousand pounds lighter than the Breda. Its braking system is advanced and it doesn't screech either, which is super nice. What both these trains have in common is that they have a set of stairs for passengers wishing to disembark and board on non-surface level stops especially prevalent on the N. Judah and J. Church lines that just kind of drop passengers off on sidewalk curbs and in the middle of the street. As I mentioned before, Muni is split up into many different lines that spur in all four directions, generally away from downtown. I'll first talk about the Central Corridor, the Market Street subway from the West Portal all the way to the Embarcadero station. Then, I'll discuss the entire T-Line, as it's basically perpendicular to the Central Corridor. Finally, I'll discuss the rest of the satellite spurs, M, J, K, and N, with the notable exception of L. You can see in this animation how integral the Market Street subway is to the operation of Mini Metro's lines, as all of them except the T funnel out of it. I'll explain every single stop on the system, noting the stop itself, as well as the community around it. This is Muni Metro. So Embarcadero serves as the eastern terminus of every single line except for N Judah and the T line, and I can't state how important this station is. First off, coming from the East Bay, this is the first SF station for BART riders after they traverse the Transbay tube, and it gets quite busy. And it provides an easy transfer to BART just a level below. This station, like I said, wasn't planned, but the construction boom of new towers in the eastern portion of downtown SF in the 80s really necessitated construction of an additional station. In terms of things to do, there are way too many to list, but off the top of my mind, you have the famous ferry building, which is still the city's premier ferry terminal and is still important to commuters to Marin and Solano counties. And you can theoretically use the ferry to transfer to Smart 2, which is nice. A lot of corporations have offices around Embarcadero and it's essential for the economy of San Francisco that the station exists because can you imagine having to drive over to downtown San Francisco every day in this dense city? Montgomery overall gives the same vibes as the Embarcadero station. It's very corporate and it's also shared with BART. It's still deep into the financial district and so of course there's not a whole lot of mixed use developments. Walk up a little bit on Kearney Street and you will see some really nice development. What is very cool, just a couple of blocks away, is the Salesforce Tower and the Transbay Transit Center right there. 
This is basically a new mixed use facility with some restaurants and cafes at the bottom and I think a gym too. But more importantly, the second level of this building hosts a bus terminal with tons of inner city and local bus services. The coolest part about this whole development is that the Salesforce Park is a 300 yard, completely accessible to the public rooftop park. Salesforce Transit Center isn't at its full potential though, as the second phase of the plan involves constructing a below ground transit hub for California high speed rail and Caltrain. Yes, I know technically that Market Street and Powell, Union Square, whatever you want to call them, are two separate stations, but for brevity, I'm just combining them all into one entry. This is the first transfer station between Muni itself that we'll talk about. So here you could take the T-Line either out towards Oracle Park in Mission Bay, all the way to Sunnydale, or northbound towards Chinatown, which we'll talk about later. You gotta walk a bit to get to the T-Line platform, and then you descend into a really deep station. The walkway is pretty cool, it's lit up in nice colors, which is sweet. And listen, I know there's a lot of media backlash about Union Square, and honestly, don't let them fool you into thinking otherwise. This is still a really nice part of San Francisco, and it's a treasure. There are a bunch of really nice stores here, and I recommend going ice skating here for the holidays. I recommend seeing this place for yourself and not letting fear dictate your experience with the city. This is the last shared underground station with BART, but it's still important as it connects riders to SF City Hall and important governmental buildings. There are also a bunch of venues that have made my childhood here, like Bill Graham Civic Center and the Warfield, and you got cool museums like the Asian Art Museum. Van Ness and Civic Center share the same sphere of influence, though it's important to note that this underground station is at the southern end of the 49 bus rapid transit line, which opened, I think, in 2022. It serves as a super convenient connection to a rapid transit service up to Knob Hill and Russian Hill. Church is another underground station, this time in the Lower Haight neighborhood. I just have really one burning question on my mind. Why the hell has this Safeway not been upzoned yet? Like, it's surrounded on all sides by rail and it's just so inconveniently placed. It would be great if we just kind of replaced this low density waste of land with a more dense development that still had these stores on the ground floor. If you're super into LGBT culture, then there's no better place in the city than the Castro District. I mean, this area has a lot of LGBTQ plus friendly cafes, restaurants, and clubs, and it's pretty walkable and the cityscape itself is great. So Forest Hill is the oldest subway station west of Philadelphia in the US, being built in 1918 as part of the Twin Peaks Tunnel, and it's so damn cool. It serves the Laguna Hospital to its east and the very bougie Forest Hill neighborhood littered with insanely nice houses. The only TOD I think I see though, unfortunately, are just some dense apartments to the station's north. All right, West Portal. This station and neighborhood are awesome. This is the western terminus of the Twin Peaks Tunnel and the de facto end of the Central Corridor. Like I said, the West Portal neighborhood was built because of Muni expanding here and it's a classic streetcar suburb with compact and livable housing. On West Portal Avenue, you have great dining options, record stores, bookstores, thrift stores, and really anything you can think of. I mean, what a great addition to the San Francisco skyline. All right, outside of the Central Corridor, we have our first spur, Spur 1, which I'm calling just the T-Line because that's what it is. First up, Chinatown. You're probably wondering why the station was named after Rose Pack. Like, who is this person? Well, I'll tell you. She was an organizer who lived in San Francisco and served as a consultant to many social organizations. Frustrated with the destruction of the Mercadero Freeway, she advocated for a subway into Chinatown instead as consolation. And even though she died in 2016, she still got her wish earlier in 2023. This station is 100 feet deep because it essentially had to match the slope of the track that went underneath BART. And so, yeah, you have to take a couple of sets of escalators, so make sure to honestly set aside a few minutes to actually get to the platform. Here at Yerba Buena in Moscone, we have another underground station and the last one that comprises the central subway. Most of the development around here has to do with the large Moscone Convention Center, which hosts large, important conferences, so it's a no-brainer to have the head house right close by. Yerba Buena Gardens are a set of two parks that have breathtaking views of downtown, Close by are the very cool museums of modern art and the African diaspora. So the T-Line now makes its way back to street level after the Yerba Buena Moscone station. A lot of these newer buildings became rezoned in the last 20 years after the Loma Prieta earthquake from industrial into mixed-use residential and commercial, which is why you see much more modern architecture here at 4th and Brannan. The area around here is okay. It's certainly up and coming, but more progress needs to be done on converting these parking lots and empty industrial spaces. Luckily though, there are major plans put in place for development. 
How about a 12-story office tower on 490 Brannon, right next to the station's doorstep? Or even better, a two-tower complex with around a thousand new residential units. Right across the street from that development, you have the 636 4th Street proposal. That's a 47-story residential tower with around 500 units. San Francisco famously is lacking in building new housing units, but expect a lot of change in this neighborhood in the near future. Here on 4th and King, there are two muni platforms that are perpendicular to each other. One goes in the direction of 4th Street and stays in the median of that street, and the other platform stays in the median of King Street, and that line heads towards the Embarcadero and Oracle Park. After crossing China Basin, the very scary but cool looking 4th Street Bridge, we're officially in the Mission Bay neighborhood. Okay, so I'm only 22 years old, and even I remember not too long ago when this area was basically just an overflow parking lot for Giants games at Oracle. This station references the northern part and the most new development of Mission Bay called Mission Rock, with a brand new canyon uh, tower with a cool ravine in the middle. To the stops left, you have a litter of apartments and a great density along with mixed use with uh, great food and drink options and even a community market on 4th and Channel. In all, these developments in total aim to house 1,200 residents with 40% of units set aside for low to middle income households. South of the station, you have the Mission Bay Commons, a park that hosts the Spark Social SF, which is a food truck park and a beer garden open every day. UCSF Chase Center and Medical Center are the last two stations in Mission Bay. And shocker, the first station is named after the Golden State Warriors brand new arena that opened up in 2019. Thrive City is the plaza surrounding Chase, and I'll say the arena is very well executed in its design. There are plenty of restaurants surrounding the plaza that are accessible to the public, which I'm a huge fan of. Now we're in the Dog Patch neighborhood, which is like Mission Bay if it was less gentrified, although it still is kind of very much so gentrified. Most of the residential units built in this millennium were converted from industrial use. Plenty of mid-rise lofts hug 3rd Street and the Muni Corridor, but in very important news, there's a massive 29-acre development on the site of the former Dog Patch power plant fittingly named Power Station that's bringing about 2,000 residences to the area. Pretty exciting stuff. I mean, this will be the first time in 150 years that the Dogpatch neighborhood will have waterfront access, which is pretty nice. So here at Marin and Evans, we're entering a part of SF known as Bayview. It's kind of by Hunter's Point. A great addition to the neighborhood was the Southeast Community Center, which opened up in 2022 to serve these two neighborhoods. And I think we should honestly build more of these centers with you know, free Wi-Fi, reading spaces, and public resources in communities that seem to get outpriced of cities like San Francisco and San Jose. Okay, yeah, these stations at Hudson and Kirkwood are more in the heart of Hunter's Point, and they actually have houses next to them. These newer developments here are mostly affordable, such as the Bayview Commons Apartments. There are no specific development plans for mixed-use housing that I could find in the immediate area, but the Hunter's Point general plan calls for a myriad of different changes to the neighborhood to make it more livable, including diverting truck traffic away from 3rd Street, prioritizing the light rail's right-of-way to make it run more efficiently, and creating a comprehensive bicycle and pedestrian pathway system that is currently lacking here. Around Oakdale and Revere, you'll start to see a lot of more compact small businesses in the central 3rd Street corridor. I love how Muni basically built the light rail corridor in an already existing commercial strip in Hunter's Point. I know I like to talk a lot about mixed-use, uh, high-rise developments on this channel, but I have to give more love to the traditional walkable areas in middle-class communities in a similar vein to the Southeast Community Center, another public venue is right next to the Carroll Station, uh, the MLK Pool, and the KC Jones Playground. Here at Gilman, uh, we have the last two stations in the Hunters Point neighborhood. The latter station has a decent mid-rise by it, and yeah, I'd say Muni is pretty well integrated with Hunters Point and Bayview, building light rail rights of way in well-established communities. Here we are at Sunnydale, the terminus of the T-Line in the Visitacion Valley neighborhood. I covered this in my Caltrain video a while back, so check that out for more. I also mentioned uh, my frustration with a combined intermodal and muni Caltrain station at Bayshore, and thankfully the development addresses this with planned walkways to connect the two distant platforms, which are separated by a 15-minute walk, which is pretty inexcusable. The neighborhood itself is pretty walkable, I have to say. Uh, there is a nice little central corridor there. Here, I'll be talking about the former right-of-way for the T-Line, which at this point now heads into the central subway, leaving N. Judah to run this right-of-way. We already went through 4th and King, so now we're on to 2nd and King, which is right by Oracle Park, home of the SF Giants. 
A lot like Chase Center, there are a lot of attractions accessible to the public outside of the ballpark. There are a couple of developments on Toos Townsend Street. There's the Bayside Village that's pretty close by to the station. Here at Folsom, we're basically near the heart of downtown with developments that are sky high. And there are a bunch of tech campuses around here near the waterfront, especially from Google and Mozilla. This is the final station above ground before Muni Tunnels underground and meets the Embarcadero Intermodal Station on the Market Street subway. Here at Spur 3, we'll talk about the J Church Line all the way to Balboa Park. So the J Church Line emerges from the Market Street subway right by that Waste of Space Safeway and then turns south on Church continuing on street level. I do like how there is a light rail line, but it's not physically separated from the street and it's enforced by red paint. The area around here is gorgeous with old Victorian style architecture that SF is really known for globally. Annoyingly, it runs with street traffic for a couple of blocks until it gets its own right of way by Dolores Park. Now we're entering probably one of my favorite parts of SF, the Mission District. I love the food here. It's a historically Latina neighborhood with uh, major and real concerns about gentrification. But nonetheless, the right of way hugs the side of the Lotus Park where you have breathtaking views of the skyline. It's one of the more popular parks in San Francisco with tons of people taking in the view. Mission the Lotus 2 is a couple of blocks above the park. The right of way is super cool and I love how it cuts through the backyards of all these residences snaking through the Lotus Heights. Unfortunately, Muni gets dumped onto the street again at around 22nd Street, and we're sandwiched between Noya Valley and Dolores Heights. Here, there aren't going to be a lot of newer developments, as many of these houses were built in the early 1900s pre-car, so they had to be dense as the only alternative to walking was taking the train. I should mention that my good friend Off-Brand Urbanism actually made a video about the J Church line, talking more specifically about this spur of uni that y'all should check out. But yeah, typically on these stations that are in the middle of streets, it's not necessarily the most accessible, although some stops do have wheelchair ramps. Noah Valley itself, again, is a very decent and dense neighborhood. I've been trying my best to find new developments around here, but I'm finding at best low to medium density residences with max like four units. Finally, after 30th Street, the line turns to the east and gets into a median at San Jose Avenue for a bit. The Randall Station is decently integrated with its own side platforms accessible by a crosswalk. Glen Park's Muni Station is connected to the BART station by a pedestrian crossing above the street. The neighborhood is great and is another one of my favorites in the city, especially with awesome businesses like Bird and Beckett Books on Channery Street and La Corneta on Diamond Street, for example. After passing underneath 280, there are a couple of on-street stops again with nothing more than a couple of concrete slabs on the sides. Here at Balboa, though, we have the end of our spur and the station is pretty odd. So it's the terminus of the J, K, and M lines, and so it's kind of a confusing loop of overhead lines and tracks. I was trying to find my way around the station to catch BART, and in my experience, it's not super well integrated. It's for sure an old school light rail depot and terminal with the way everything besides BART is basically running at grade with car and pedestrian traffic. Capuso is an effort to make this neighborhood more dense. It's a massive, prominent development across the street from the head house with 1,600 units and 3,000 square feet of retail space on the bottom. So this spur from Duboche Triangle to Ocean Beach is going to follow a major part of the N. Judah line going west all the way to the Pacific Ocean at Ocean Beach. After this messy Duboche Triangle interchange, which is some parts above surface and some parts below grade, it goes on its own right of way in the median of the street and then goes completely on its own by Duboche Park, which is a nice oasis from the high density neighborhood around it. But yeah, it's tunnel time and instead of using the Twin Peaks tunnel, this line uses a separate 4,230 foot long tunnel called the Sunset Tunnel, which is right underneath Buena Vista Park. Emerging from the tunnel, the line runs back onto Carl Street and we're in the Haight neighborhood. Also for music lovers and just lovers of rock culture in general is the Haight and Ashbury district a couple of blocks north of the Coal Street station. There's Amoeba Music for starters, too many restaurants to count, and a bunch of book and secondhand stores. Cars can be a burden on these neighborhoods that just aren't really designed for them. So as a result, there's no right of way for muni trains. If you want the Todd God radical solution to this major problem with really, really narrow streets that can't accommodate both cars cars and light rail vehicles, it would be a great solution to just shut this street down to private vehicle traffic. And I know it won't happen in the near future because some districts like the Sunset can get pretty nimby, but hey, a dude can dream. As we get closer to 9th Avenue, you start to see a lot more on-street businesses. Some nice efforts are made, such as a station on 6th Avenue with a modern wheelchair ramp and a bulb out from the street. After going south on 9th and going back west on Judah, Muni gets its own right of way yet again, but this only lasts for 10 streets between 9th and 19th Avenues. So at this point from 19th Avenue to Ocean Beach, the area is as suburban as it gets. 
I mean, these homes were now built for cars at this point because this landmass, previously known as outside lands, was basically a bunch of sand dunes littering the landscape. It remained this way until the mid 1950s when streetcar lines like N. Judah allowed people east of Twin Peaks to come and enjoy the ocean beach. It's pretty, don't get me wrong, but there aren't a lot of things to do around here besides go to the beach and visit a handful of businesses on Judah right by the streetcar stop. Here at Spur 5, we're just talking about the West Portal to Balboa Park Spur. After the West Portal Tunnel, the line unfortunately runs on the street once again on West Portal Avenue. As mentioned before, this district is very awesome and dense and there are a lot of businesses to frolic. Past the Sloat Station though, the line runs on a very narrow track past two very funny stops at Ocean Avenue and Eucalyptus. I mean, they're just the tiniest and little narrowest platforms, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. After this right of way, the line gets to join the median of 19th Avenue, this massive, boring, awful strode. Nonetheless, we're right here in front of one of the earliest malls in SF called Stonestown Galleria. It's a decent mall that's mid-sized, not super glamorous, but I appreciate the efforts made by Muni to connect it to transit with a dedicated walkway between the mall and the platform. Holloway is more known for being right in front of San Francisco State. It's super close to the campus's quad. It's super useful for students who don't have a car for accessing downtown. This platform is unfortunately not in a street meeting anymore, and it's basically a streetcar stop after the line passes the northbound 19th Avenue lanes. It's close to the massive Park Merced Towers, a development that has some single family apartments and a massive inefficient use of space outside of these really nice, dense towers. Running on Randolph Street, the Ingleside and Ocean View neighborhoods are mostly residential with groups of small businesses bundled together, and it's the same story with San Jose Avenue. This line runs on the street in mixed traffic through single-family homes until it stops on Geneva Avenue just across from Glen Park and the new development that I talked about earlier. Now this spur comes from West Portal, but instead of continuing southwest from Slope, it goes into the Sarah Boulevard median southward. Sarah and Ocean has little around it. It's surrounded on both sides by a strode, and there's even a park and ride lot to its left. Uh, park and ride lot in SF? I've never seen that before in Muni. That's pretty wild. I really like the spur between Ocean and Balboa Park. You're still on a central business corridor with buildings that have downstairs business tenants and upstairs residences. In addition, there are brand new developments like the Avalon with businesses on street level on Lee Street. Shout out to Phil's Coffee which is super sweet and the most dense urbanism I've seen on the spur yet. The Ocean CCSF station has a very nice pedestrian bridge over Ocean Avenue to the City College of San Francisco, and I like how there's a great effort to connect institutions of higher learning to transit, catering to the student who wants to commute using alternative, car-free methods. After crossing 280, the line meets up with BART at Balboa Park, and you can see now how important and intermodal this combined Muni to BART station is. All right, so there's going to be an expansion into North Beach, like I said, but the way that it expands is still kind of under consideration. I was talking actually to a worker for Muni at the uh, Chinatown station, and he mentioned that they really did want to expand to North Beach, but they were not sure how the right of way would look. Would it be underground? Would it be above ground? Or would it just run in the middle of a street median. The central subway costs $1.95 billion to construct, so I would imagine a tunnel in the North Beach would be no small feat and would take a lot of effort and fun. Nothing is officially set in stone. There are a lot of proposals at this point, a lot of surveys being done, a lot of studies being considered. So I can't tell you what exactly Muni has in store. What I would highly recommend though at this point is a Geary Muni Metro line. There used to be service on Geary, like I mentioned, the B and C lines used to run on Geary, yet were discontinued. At this point, connecting Muni to Geary would be quite a feat as well. There are some decent options, I think, for connecting Muni Metro to a Geary extension. You could simply just have it branch out from the, the, you know, the Market Street subway. As soon as Geary turns into a strode, it would go above ground and then just ride in the median. I think Geary is way too damn wide for its own good. And there are a lot of great neighborhoods that could be accessible via transit. I know there are a lot of bus lines like the 38R, Geary Rapid that do traverse the whole spur, but I think a Muni Metro extension would be very beneficial to this strip of land. And it's something that I could envision Muni doing in the next 40 to 50 years.
So to kind of start off my concerns with Muni, it all goes down to accessibility. I think the system, especially on the N line, as well as the J Church line, south of the Deboche Triangle, for example, they, they a lot of their stations are not accessible. There are some accessible platforms, don't get me wrong, the city is doing their best to correct that, but I just don't think it's fair for systems in the year of 2023 to have one inaccessible station period. And that's something that I'm glad a lot of newer systems really did adopt. All of the T stops are accessible because that line was built in 2007. Going in and retrofitting a lot of these stations would benefit this system overall. Furthermore, I think another problem that Muni does have isn't really related to Muni itself. It's related to the cars kind of around them. I don't like when systems run with street traffic. I think that is very inefficient. I think it's something that's quite frankly outdated in 2023 as well. It's not necessarily an issue that is Muni's fault. The streetcar lines themselves were actually built way before the invention of the car. So what you need to do at this point is do something very radical and that's limit that use to buses and trains. I think that ultimately the priority at this point should be making sure that streetcar rights of way are for streetcars and or buses only and not for private motor vehicle traffic. A main highlight of the system that I think is really apparent is the fact that the streetcar lines, number one, predate cars, and number two, are built mostly in conjunction with neighborhoods. I'm talking about neighborhoods like Bayshore. Bayview neighborhood didn't need a streetcar line to have a central business corridor. The streetcar line, it certainly enhances everything. It makes the neighborhood more accessible from other parts of the city, but the neighborhood itself isn't walkable because of the streetcar, it's walkable because of people. Because San Francisco prioritizes people over cars, and that's something that most American cities on the West Coast lack. I mean, a lot of cities like Los Angeles used to be very streetcar centric, but San Francisco, because of the activism, because of the fact that people in the city really care about livability, revolted in masses to end freeway expansion. They protested en masse to end this. Ultimately, that leaves San Francisco as the only city west of the Mississippi with any sense of urbanism whatsoever. San Francisco, I gotta say, Muni is quite fantastic. Outside of some concerns related to accessibility and running with private motor vehicle traffic, I think Muni is probably one of the best light rail systems in the country in terms of scale, in terms of service, in terms of transparency, in terms of how they integrate with their community. But yeah, thank you to my patrons. This content would not be possible without you guys. Thank you so much if you've made it this far, and I'll see you next time.